that. But thank you. Know, you it's it's going gonna, it's gonna to rain. So. And thank you to the library and Brandon for inviting me. What I'm going to talk today about is, I'm going to set it up with the Emancipation Proclamation, but we're going to talk, what I was, what I was told to talk about is the Emancipation Proclamation and the, um, the creation of colored troops in the Civil War and how that changed um, the makeup of the war in 1863, in 1863 and 1864, uh, leading to ultimately to a Union victory. Um, and then I, I also saw that you already, some of you may have already had a discussion about the Emancipation Proclamation somewhat last week. So, We'll see how much I match up. I'm not a big, uh, I'll be honest, I'm not a big fan of Lincoln, so. Um, you are. I am not. <laughs> um, we, may, we may clash with what happened last week. Um, and I, just to start off, I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. Um, the problem that I have is that we often, the Emancipation Proclamation obviously is a huge document, but it's not a legal document, right? Um, it takes a, an amendment to the Constitution to change or end slavery in the United States. Um, and that's something people often forget, that we need the 13th Amendment, because the, in our Constitution, our original Constitution, um, there are three locations where slavery is written into the Constitution. The Three-Fifths Clause, what we call the Three-Fifths Clause, what we call the, the Atlantic Slave Trade, continuation of the slave, and also um, the Runaway uh, Slave Act, or piece to that. So the idea that you can count three-fifths of your total black population in your state for representation, the fact that the, we're going to allow the slave trade to continue in the United States up to 1808, and the fact that we, um, if you, if a piece of property, not a, they're not talking about cows, right? they're talking about a piece of property meaning a, a, a person, if they happen to run away, that a state must recognize that and return that piece of property, right? Um, and those three pieces are written into the basis of our Constitution. So first of all, we should remember that when people start talking about, let's go back to the original Constitution, and that's what we should abide by. It's not the best Constitution in the world. Um, but the way that, that Constitution should be uh, responded to is, of course, it has to be rewritten, has to be amended. And so the Emancipation Proclamation, in that effect, does not uh, in slavery in the United States. That's why we need the 13th Amendment. And I think that we give, uh, while Lincoln is, is a very important person in that discussion, he's not the only person in that discussion. And so one of the problems that I have is when we do when we discuss against proclamation, emancipation proclamation, we leave it to Lincoln and we leave the the, um, the glory to him. And as a scholar of African American history, that's a problem to the, the white individual, the great white savior. Um, and um, as great as it is, as great, I mean, to put it in popular culture, as great as the film Lincoln by Steven Spielberg is, um, it's, it's very troubling to me that still in 2015 we don't have a movie on Frederick Douglass. We don't have one. We don't have a movie on Frederick Douglass. Or we don't have a movie on uh, Annette Turner. Um, or other individuals that during the same time period that we continue to have these these films that are upholding the white individual, the great white savior, um, and that's 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 a troubling thing. So I'm not I'm not the biggest fan of Lincoln. So that aside, I will I will say the Emancipation Proclamation, Emancipation Proclamation is a an incredible document, right? Uh, they Lincoln begins to think about the Emancipation Proclamation in uh, 1862. Um, he began to see the benefits of freeing slaves. Um, he could use the refugee slaves to support the war effort uh, while gaining support of Great Britain, uh, the European nation that had taken a strong stand in slavery already. Uh, and this would undercut the Confederacy's ability to recognize, be recognized by the European nations. And that's another thing that we forget, um, as much as we don't want to talk about it, uh, we don't actually recognize it. The United States at that, that period, of course, are two separate nations. There is the, the United States, which we, we just call the Union rather than actually calling them the United States, and then the Confederate States of America. And so Lincoln's control over that um, is, is none, that he has actually no control. So he first announced uh, to his cabinet in July of 1862 
that he would free the slaves uh, of those in re rebellion against the Union. But they, his cabinet is going to push him to not do it at that time. But they, they feel that they should get a victory on the ground before the, the, the war effort's not actually going very well for the Union at that time. Um, but a key thing that I just said there, he's going to, re to free the slaves in the rebellion areas. So once again, he's going. He's announcing that he is going to free the slaves in a territory that he has no power. Right? Um, to give you an example, I don't know how far we are from Missouri. I drive down. I never know where we are. I drive from Kansas. But um, you know, the example I always use up in, in Northeast Kansas is that you know, uh, Governor Brownback may make a declaration about what he feels Missouri should do, but he has no power over Jay Nixon. Right? He can't force him. So Lincoln can say, I'm going to free the slaves in the rebellion territories, but he actually cannot force Jefferson Davis or the slaves to be free. He must put something behind it. He has to get in there with military force. Right? That's the only way it can be done. But there was a secession. And when, they, you made, when they made the secession and withdrew from the Union, Lincoln had no power. That's my point. That's my point. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. But that's not Lincoln's fault. No, that's not other than he tried to free the slaves. I'm not blaming Lincoln. I wouldn't say they tried to free the slaves here. No. Um, we've got to remember that in, in, when Lincoln first talked about this slavery and the existence of slavery, people like to say that he was always morally against slavery, and that is true. Uh, but Lincoln also thought slavery should just exist in its, its borders where it's at right now. So he doesn't want to extend it. He's a part of a non-extended party. And that, that is what the Republican Party is. It's not an abolitionist party. It's not an anti-slavery party. It's a non-extensionist party. And the belief is that what he tells everyone in the Lincoln-Douglas debates is that he believes that slavery will die out in 100 years. So to put it in perspective, when we have Brown v. Board passed in this state and the nation is when Lincoln believed that slavery would end. Well, would he, uh, uh, so we're going to have a debate. That's okay. good. Go ahead. Oh, OK. Would he, uh, uh, declared the uh, emancipation, he knew that the South was not going to go on with it, and probably would be war as a result of it. And, uh, yes and no. But, and uh, it, would, it would have been a, a transition, a, a gra more of a gradual transition if he could take this north and get everybody behind it, because not everybody in the north was uh, in, in, uh, endorsed that either. You know. Yes and no. And there were plenty of people in the South that uh, wanted slaves free too, so it, was, it, it would create less conflict by at least dividing them first, but he didn't figure that would happen like that. No, 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 no. Um, let's back up. You're giving Lincoln too much credit. Oh. Again, as, as most people do. Well, let's um, go discredit him either. No. I come from the land of Lincoln, so I can discredit him all the time. Um, he was a good president. I think the biggest thing that I understand about Lincoln, um, unlike we, the thing that we don't give politicians the, the, the ability to do today is he grew in office. And he admitted when he made mistakes and he changed things. We don't allow politicians to do that today. Um, Lincoln would not survive in our political climate today. Um, he would not be able to do the wishy-washy things that I'm about ready to talk about. Things will become infinitely more complex than they were 140, 50 years ago. Oh, I, I think the Civil War is quite complex. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there are too many extraneous things that are not just the Civil War that would probably that would be associated today. Well, uh, he's dealing with he's dealing with France, he's dealing with England, he's dealing with Spain, all amongst dealing with the, the Civil War. So I think that things are very complex in this country. Oh, I didn't um, say it wasn't complex, yeah. but so, it was. So. So Lincoln first announces his Emancipation Proclamation, or his proposal in, in 62, in July 62. Um, and he's going to push it then in September of 62, 10 days after Antietam, right? Uh, when the Union wins in Antietam is when he's going to issue this, uh, this statement that he's going to free the slaves. And again, this is a key point to understand, that he issues in September what they call the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, which is something that people leave out in history. The preliminary, right? So in September of 62, he's going to issue um, a preliminary 
Emancipation Proclamation that says that I'm going to give you until January to surrender, and if you don't surrender, then I'm going to issue this proclamation that's going to free your slaves. Right? Something, again, we leave out in history. Because we want to tell you that Lincoln is this man that comes in and saves the, saves the day and is the man that frees, frees African Americans. Um, so, he, the proclamation gave the rebels until January 1st, 1863 to cease the rebellion or lose their slaves. The proclamation recommended that Congress offer mandatory assistance to slave states, not in rebellion, to enable them to, to institute a gradual emancipation. So in the states such as Missouri that are not a rebellion, he's asking Congress to figure out how they can slowly end slavery. Right? Not immediate. The same way that he is declaring he's going to do in rebel territory. So he's not going to upset Missouri, he's not going to upset Maryland, he's not going to upset Kentucky. So he's got this two-tier plan that he's going to do. Um, and also offer them monetary assistance so pay them for their slaves, to have freed their slaves right? um, in this uh, way, as well as, still in 1862, continue to propose the idea of colonizing blacks out of this country. So you want to free your slaves, but you don't want them in your, t in your state anymore? We will help you try to find a place to put them. And Lincoln's face, favorite place was Central America, is where he's looking at. Um, but we the continent of Africa, we're looking at um, Haiti, right? we look at um, Canada, are all different places that they look at over the time. Right? Um, we forget in our history that Liberia itself, the state of the country of Liberia, is started by the United States. It's carved out of the continent of Africa right? and started um, by the United States as a place to send Africans, African Americans, freed slaves back to. Right? That's why they. This, the, the country of Liberia has a middle, it has a uh, capital name as Monrovia. Monrovia. It's, it's well, it's written after President Monroe. Right. Um, he is the man who uh, declares it a location. Right. Now we all know, of course, that Lincoln, that the the Confederacy does not heed Lincoln's command. And so on January 1st, 1863, Lincoln does sign the final Emancipation Proclamation. This proclamation freed slaves in rebel states. It did not include, as he had done in his earlier discussions, plans for colonization or compensation. Um, the war had officially become a battle to restore the Union and eradicate slavery with this new official proclamation, right? Now, but again, understand that this Emancipation Proclamation frees slaves in rebel territories. Right? So it only frees slaves in territories that are not part of the Union. It only frees ter slaves in, in territories that Lincoln has no control over. The only way he can free a slave, or the Union can free a slave with this document, is by military occupation by them bringing it. To, to, to put it simply, as I always tell my students, it is a nice document without teeth. It's a piece of paper without teeth. Sentiment, fantastic. But it can actually, it actually does nothing until someone is there militarily. And to show you how complicated it gets, the Union at this time has retaken parts of Louisiana, right. Tennessee, and others, other southern places that have seceded. If you read the Emancipation Proclamation very, very carefully, those territories in states that are still in rebellion but are controlled, sections are controlled by the Union, those counties, those locations, the, free, the slaves are not free in those locations. So certain, certain areas of Louisiana, slaves are not free. Certain areas of of Tennessee, slaves are not free. Even though the Union controls that space. You understand how confusing and, and really strange document this is that, that we have here. Um, that aside, 
African Americans look at the Emancipation Proclamation as the coming of Jubilee. There's no question about it. It is a fantastic document. There's, um, there's photographs, and I brought some of the movies, but the PowerPoint is just fine. There's photographs of, of people waiting over the telegraph, waiting on January 1st, anticipating, is he really going to do it? Right? He's, he's promised this document. Is it really going to come across? Are we going to pass this Emancipation Proclamation? Right? That whole thousands of people turn out in Boston, Massachusetts, waiting in the church, right? where they could set up the telegraph, waiting for this thing to, to come across the waters. And so when it does, it's a moment of jubilee, there is no question, right? Um, but at the same time, it has its limitations. Newly freed men and women in the South celebrated. Right? In Hampton, Virginia, for example, blacks gathered under a large oak tree for the reading of the proclamation. The tree, um, now known as the Emancipation Oak, still stands on Hampton University's uh, campus. The college was erected on the exact site where Mary Peak opened a school for blacks in 1861, and where they, the newly freed men and women also celebrated um, that emancipation. After Americans celebrate when troops come to the Sea Islands, just off the coast of the Carolinas and Georgia, right? Islanders were formally presented flags and listed, listened to moving speeches about the meaning of the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, as I've explained, of course, slaves under full Confederate control could not openly celebrate emancipation, and many slaves held by Confederates did not know about the proclamation because their owners moved their operations to remote locations so that they could keep their slaves. Um, and those slaves are going to remain unaffected by Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. This is why we have um, uh, Juneteenth, a celebration every summer where we recognize uh, the last, what we believe to be, the last slaves getting word that emancipation has come uh, at the end of the war, after the war. Right? It's an important thing to understand. So this is really something that happens and frees everyone. Right? Um, why is it taking until after April of 1865 for slaves in Texas to realize that they are free? Stories that we leave out of that discussion when we talk about this emancipation proclamation. Because we want that story to be something where it is a simple story. Right? And it is a story of, of a very good president signing a document because he's morally convinced that slavery is wrong. And that's a story that we want to hold up in this country. We constantly do it. Because many times that we want to have the discussion, and I think this is one of the great things about um, pro programs like what you have here, looking at 63 to 1963 is that it should open up a dialogue to answer and talk about the tough questions that still exist in our country. The tough questions that uh, can explain why we sit here and maybe don't understand what's happening uh, in Ferguson, Missouri, or Baltimore, Maryland. But it has a lineage, it has a connection all the way back to this time period. Right? It has um, it, you can better understand it if you know that history. Right? Um, and so we have these easy discussions. It's simple to say, Lincoln freed the slaves. Rather than actually have that tough discussion and say, well, he did and he didn't, and it's okay in some places, and yeah, he, he, he's a guy who was against slavery, but it wasn't really a full abolitionist against slavery. And, and we, so it's a, it's a change of discussion that we want to have. Right? To, to get you to understand a little bit more, in 2008, or 2007, the world uh, watched as the country of England recognized the ending of the slave trade. The slave trade, they, they ended in 1807, one year before our Constitution claimed that we were going to end the slave trade in 1808. And the state of the, the country of England had huge uh, discussions about it, 
what it meant, um, what uh, they had museums, all had exhibits, they even put out coins, right, um, commemorating, or uh, at least acknowledging the end of the slave trade. But they had those tough discussions of what does it mean that we end the slave trade, but we don't end, end slavery? What does that mean? That we can stop the, the moving of human beings across the Atlantic Ocean, or at least attempt to, but we don't stop holding them in bondage. England has that tough discussion in 2007. And oddly enough, they, still, they also connect with the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the independence of Ghana. Ghana gets their independence in 1957. And so they recognize that this is all connected. The ending of the slave trade, our, our connection to Ghana, our colonialism in Ghana, right? Ghana gaining, gaining its independence, it's all connected. They send delegations there to recognize it. They bring it all together. And we sat back as a country and said, we're going to do that too. We're going to have that discussion. Do you remember that discussion? No. Because we didn't have that discussion. It got pushed off to the side. We never did anything about it. But in 2009, what did we do? What did we do in 2009? We recognized the anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's birth. And you can go back in the newspapers in 2009 and see almost every country, every newspaper in this country recognizing Lincoln and having that discussion about what? The Emancipation Proclamation and how great this man was because he issued the Emancipation Proclamation. But we won't have that tough discussion of what does it mean that we end the slave trade in 1808 and slavery continues to exist in this country for another 50 hours, 40, 40, 40 hours. We won't have that discussion because it's tough. It's tough. And so we leave ourselves out there in that space. And so that's, you know, to kind of trouble the waters there for you with the Emancipation Proclamation. I'm sure that's not the story you've got people right? with the Emancipation Proclamation. And we can talk about that more if you want. Now, tied to this, of course, um, the other thing that comes along is the discussion in the war effort of how African Americans can participate. What do we do with that? I mean, even think about um, African Americans are freeing, are running away from the moment the Civil War starts. One of my favorite opening lines of a, of a book chapter is by W. E. Boyd's of Black Reconstruction. He says, um, Edmund Ruffin, white-haired and mad, freed the slaves with the first shot of Fort Sumner. I always say to myself, if I can write a line like that, I can quit. Would you repeat that? Yes. Edmund Ruffin, white-haired and mad, Ruffin, the man who fires the first shot. White-haired and mad, he gets away with calling him white-haired and mad. Freed the slaves with the first shot on Fort Sumner. What he's telling you is, of course, that fire, that gun shot, changed the landscape forever. It's not the Emancipation Proclamation. It's the fact that there's chaos, that war is going on. And African Americans held in bondage, and the ones that are not held in bondage, recognize that chaos. And African Americans immediately begin to run, to leave their plantations. Not everyone, but in mass numbers. And they force the federal government to react to them. What are we going to do with these people? Because again, we're a nation of laws. And we have laws three times over. Our Constitution, 1793, and 1850, telling you that if a runaway slave comes to your area, you must return them. In our Constitution, Constitution is not enough, so 1793 we pass another law. That's not enough, so in 1850 we pass another law. 
forcing us to return property, whether it's against your moral judgment or not. Think about that. Well, it was endorsed by the Supreme Court. What was Roger, it? Roger Taney, Dred Scott. What was for enforced? Dred Scott. Scott is not a fugitive slave. He, no, he had was. No, he's not. Fred, Dred Scott is a man who's suing for his freedom because he's a man who who says that because he was taken to free territory. And he said he had to go back to slavery. No, no. Dred Scott is a man who was taken by his slave master to Rock Island, Illinois, Illinois. and then to Wisconsin, right. and then returned with him to Missouri. He's not a fugitive. He has never been out of control of his master. But what Dred Scott sues based on is the fact that he was taken to free territory and lived in free territory, that he should be free. The Supreme Court didn't back him. No, the Supreme Court does not back him, but it, he's not a fugitive slave. No. It's, there's a difference. It's a slight conjecture. No, it's, it's a big conjecture. It's a very, very big thing, right? He's, not, he's a man who, who did, not, he did not run away. He tried to use the court of law to, to base his argument. He's not the first one, by the way. He's not the, he, he, other people actually won their cases. Right. But he, he is a man who sues based on the, um, on the fact that he was taken to free territory. And if you read Judge Tani's uh, decision, he actually doesn't call him a fugitive. And he doesn't tell him that he has to, to re return to slavery. He just tells him he has no rights. Um, that, that decision, what he tells you, it's a two-pronged decision, um, and we forget the second prong um, because we like to use the quick quote. Uh, that Judge Tony says that you have based on, um, really it's based on the 1793 uh, naturalization law, that you have no right to be in my courtroom because you cannot be a citizen of the United States. Um, and so therefore you have no rights that a white man is bound to, to respect, is the quote by Tanner. Right? And that we, we like to use that quote. The second piece of that, that um, ruling by Judge Tenney, he takes the liberty of the Supreme Court, like most Supreme Courts, and tries to make it a statement much larger. And what he's actually doing at that time uh, is he, t he t takes the opportunity to speak into um, what's been happening in our country, including Kansas, um, in the discussion of the expansion of slavery, right? the Kansas-Nebraska, Acts, right? The Wilmot Proviso, right? The uh, Missouri Compromise of 1820. All these compromises, all these laws that we continue to pass. And Judge Tenney says that none of that makes sense. And you have no right to do that. And he throws it all out. And so what Judge Tenney does in actually in 1857 is says slavery can go wherever you want it to go. So it's actually a much more damaging. Everyone wants to focus on Dred Scott. But what Tenney is doing in 57 is, is more dangerous than telling you that Dred Scott has no rights. Right. So that's an important thing to understand when you say he's taking the opportunity as a Supreme Court. This has nothing to do with this case, except for the fact that he's saying slavery could exist in Iowa if, if the people in Iowa want it to exist. Slavery can exist in, in Illinois if the people in, in Illinois want it to exist. Slavery can exist in Wisconsin if the people in Wisconsin want it to exist. There is no binding law that allows that. It can expand to wherever you want it to. So it's a two-pronged decision, but it has nothing to do with the future. Nothing to do with the future. So at the, the start of the war, the Union is going to reject black volunteers into the, to the military. But in 1862, General Hunter was finally authorized to enlist black volunteers. 100 men from the Sea Islands signed up, and they became members of the first South Carolina Volunteers, later called the 39th U.S. Colored Troops. General Butler, down in Louisiana, uh, transformed the Louisiana Native Guards, a unit of three blacks in New Orleans that had been formed to serve the Confederacy but refused, uh, into they are trained or converted into a federal unit. So not this kind of loose natural National Guard unit. Neither unit actually saw, sees action uh, until um, or prior to the Emancipation Proclamation. And I, I will take a moment just for clarification there too. 
you know, this group in Louisiana is being formed to, to fight or um, to serve the Confederacy. I, I catch myself there fighting. Um, they're, they're formed to serve the Confederacy. Is an important thing to understand because um, the Confederacy does not have black soldiers. They have blacks that work in the in the army and serve the army, but there is no single muster record that musters in a black man into the military service of the Confederacy. There's a lot of books that try to tell you that, but if you actually go and ask them for the muster records, none of them can provide the muster records. You can provide thousands of muster records of the, of the North. Right? Uh, I don't the muster records, draft records, drafting right. them into the army. Right. right? Um, there's no record whatsoever. And so the point, in, therefore, is that they're being forced to join the military. They're not doing it volunteer. They're not being drafted into the military. Um, it's not until right on the eve of the, um, the surrender that Jefferson Davis actually begins to thoroughly discuss uh, trying to enlist black soldiers because he sees the writing on the wall that the war is, going, is coming to an end and he's, he's going to be on the losing side. And within the last two months is when he really starts to discuss this issue, um, which I think a lot of historians skip over. If, if their black participation in the Confederacy in earlier years, why is the president of the Confederacy at that moment now beginning to talk about it? They forget that document, those, those records, and jump back and try to show you um, what's going on. So it's, it's always troublesome to me as a person who, who studies this stuff to, to hear that, for one, and then to also see um, people dressed African American, the reenactors to see African Americans dressed in Confederate uniform, trying to tell people that they existed in there. There's no way they, they have. But I'm sorry. I lived in the city of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania for a very, very short period of time. Um, and I got very frustrated with Civil War reenactors. I hope no one's a Civil War reenactor. But it was, it was a frustrating experience to watch them every day um, often retell a story that is not true um, and you know, also sit out on a hot July day in, in itchy cotton clothes and eat bean soup when they're sitting out in front of a restaurant that they can eat in, right? They thought they were being authentic because they're sitting in the street. Um, I also saw it was the very disturbing thing of watching the, the November parade for the Gettysburg Address and by that time, I knew I was not going to stay in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania uh, at all. Um, a town that has more Confederate flags, Confederate Virginia battle flags than I've ever seen in my life. Um, they, what was the name of the town? Gettysburg. 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 And uh, I, so I asked the people there where I should go to watch the parade, because uh, this was the only time I'd ever see it. And they told me I should go to such and such location, because that's where Lincoln stands. I'll go watch Lincoln. I'm game for this. And as the procession of the parade comes down, the first three units in the parade are Confederate uh, units. So again, you wonder what story they're retelling. Um, and as the first group comes and approaches Abraham Lincoln, uh, and they raise the Confederate battle flag, um, Lincoln stands up and salutes him as they go by. Wow. Very powerful moment. Um, to watch that and people hear them cheer as you're sitting in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, a place that this, the North, of course, won the battle. A dramatic changing point in the battle. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it is only seven miles from the Mason-Dixon line, to put it in a little perspective. But, um, but it, was, it was an amazing, amazing thing to watch. Um, and it is a place, again, that I still believe, if you want to count it, um, you would have more Confederate battle flags flown in that city than any other place that you've ever seen. Um, I often wonder what they're doing in the controversy that we're having in the last few months. So, at first, a few black volunteered to fight. Um, they were uncertain whether or not the federal government would sincerely promote emancipation and extend full citizenship as they promised. Only one recruit volunteered after Henry Highland Garnett 
and Frederick Douglass gave stirring speeches promoting military service at a meeting in April 1863. It actually happens April 27, 1863. So Henry Highland Garnett is a person that most people don't know, which you should. Henry Highland Garnett is a uh, preacher, uh, AME church preacher, uh, that ultimately goes to Zion, goes to uh, Georgia as a chaplain in the Union Army, and then begins to really develop the AME church behind, at the end of the war, throughout the South, but particularly in Georgia. And he, he um, can give stirring, stirring speeches. Um, and he, he gives these great speeches. Uh, Douglas also gives a speech, and imagine, that he gives a stirring speech to this audience, and one person comes up and says, I'll volunteer for the Union. Not the exact thing that the Union... What was the year? This is 1863. This is April 27th of 1863. So this is you know, four months after the Emancipation Proclamation is issued. And you've got people that are wondering whether or not you're really going to enforce this piece of paper that you've issued. So again, this idea that we think that this Emancipation Proclamation transforms everything. Right? People are not willing to put their life on the line in this issue because why are you going, why are we going to do this if you're not going to give us one full emancipation what what guarantees that and two are you going to give us full citizenship which is an important thing to understand citizenship doesn't mean just freedom it means the right to vote it means the right to have property all the other things and the other things that they were denied after Americans were denied after the, the participating in the war of 1812 and participating in the American Revolution. All things that they were promised, but denied. So what's going to be different here in this war among states? Douglas focused much of his effort on recruiting soldiers throughout the, throughout the war. And in the end, he's going to re, they're going to recruit 179,000 black men uh, to enlist in the US colored troops. Almost 10% of all um, who served in the Union Army. Approximately 33,000 uh, were free blacks from the Union States. 42,000 were former slaves and free men from border states. And 99,000 were former slaves from Confederate states of these black soldiers, of all these black soldiers. 7,122 were non-commissioned officers. And a few were commissioned officers, such as a man named Martin Delaney. Mm -hmm. Martin Delaney. Martin Delaney ultimately goes to South Carolina. To give you a background, a quick background of Martin Delaney. Martin Delaney is a black political leader, uh, becomes a politician. Uh, but on the eve of the Civil War, he is actually trying to convince blacks to get out of the country. Um, that he feels that the, the country, America is not going to be the place for them. And he is looking at Canada, and he is especially looking at the Niger Valley region of, of Africa. He's, he sent an expedition there, he goes on an expedition, and begins to promote what they call colonization or immigration to the continent of Africa. The war starts, Delaney changes his tune, right? That he decides that he's going to come back and participate. Uh, as Douglas, Douglas also, at the, uh, right before the war begins, Douglas is looking at Haiti as a possible place. You know, and we can talk about that in question and answer. But the 18, 1850s are, is a very troubled time uh, in, in America, especially for black Americans. They, they view that this is a point that things are going to fall apart. You've got the, the Dred Scott decision in 1857. You've got the 1850 compromise that has the, the real new st stiff uh, fugitive slave law. You've got Kansas, Nebraska, the Kansas Wars, right? They see this in that, that there's the slavery continues to expand and the restrictions on blacks continue to to pile up, right? And so people are, are, are wondering, this is not the place for us. Um, and so they begin to do this and move. Another 29,000 black men served in the, in the, in the Navy. Uh, and blacks fought almost in almost 20, uh, 250 battles and sustained more than 37,000 casualties. I always feel weird to get that number, but, uh, but it's, it shows you how much they were actually in battle. 17 black soldiers and four black um, sailors earned the Congressional Medal of Honor. 
in the, in the war effort. Now, while, while fighting for the Union, black soldiers were still subjugated to racial prejudice and had to adhere to prescribed white uh, racial hierarchy. White officers led black units, meaning that there were no black officers that were in the charge of black units. Uh, these white officers varied in motivations, quality, and effectiveness. The only story we, we remember is the exceptional one, someone like Robert Gould Shaw, who is the head of the 54th uh, Massachusetts Volunteer Regiment, uh, the movie Glory. Um, he is an exception. He does a good job. Um, but most people are not that way. Uh, this unit was raised, uh, this unit itself, uh, Shaw, a, an abolitionist himself, or comes from an abolitionist family, um, and the, that unit, that specific unit was really raised by abolitionists. It was selected by abolitionists, and Frederick Douglass was instru instrumental in um, creating that unit, including the fact that two of his sons signed up for the unit and fought in that unit. They are going to, soldiers are going to endure many inequities. White officers assign them to the most difficult non combat units or duties, including a uh, high amount of manual labor. These white officers often mismanage the black troops <coughs> they led, which resulted in excessive casualties. And the other thing that happens is, is Confederates threaten black soldiers captured in uniform, uh, that they would be uh, treated as instigators of slave insurrection and would result in their enslavement or execution. And this actually happened in April of 1864. Um, in 1864, um, scores of black soldiers were captured in Tennessee when they took back the Fort Pillow. And when they took back the Fort Pillow, the Confederates um, captured white and black soldiers. They placed white soldier, white Union soldiers under arrest. They lined up the black soldiers in the middle of the fort and shot them dead. Who is the leader of the Confederate soldiers at Fort Pillow? He's a man named Nathan Bedford Thomas. Or, excuse me, Nathan Bedford Forrest. And Nathan Bedford Forrest is the founder of the Ku Klux Klan in 1866 important thing to understand. Also the name, which still baffles me, everyone says it's sarcastic, of the famous movie Forrest Gump. The, open, the opening scene of that movie is still troubling that I've never seen the rest of it because it opens up with him saying, my name is Forrest, I'm named after Nathan Bedford Forrest, the leader of the Ku Klux Klan, and then everyone continues to go through the movie laughing. Um, in my opinion, it's, it's a terrible, terrible thing to, to name a movie that and, and think that that's funny. We would not allow a film to be named the uh, Adolf Hitler. My name is Adolf, and I'm named after Adolf Hitler, or we can choose any other name. But we think it's funny as a nation to allow a film to be named, or it can be satirical to allow a film to be named that. Uh, and it's always troubling to me that a man like Nathan Bedford Forrest uh, just alone on his four pillow incidences, but um, the, the, the forming of the Ku Klux Klan. And we can talk about the violence of the Ku Klux Klan and the, and the death of over 20,000 people between 18, 1866 and 1872 um, by the organization that he found um, is, is, a, is a sad state that, that we allow that. Or at least we don't engage in and talk about it. What does this mean? To their credit, the, the Confederates and, and uh, Forrest say the incident never happened, that it never occurred. Um, we didn't kill these black soldiers, they, just, they ran off. Um, but Lincoln, to his credit, I'll give Lincoln credit, uh, he actually responded to this in April 64 and said, if this happens again, we'll do the same to your soldiers. Now, it's a threat he never did, he never used, but the fact that he used that threat is a powerful statement, I think, on his part, um, that he, he understands it. Of course, if it can, black soldiers are continue to, to be shot and killed when they're captured, then you're not going to get any black volunteers anymore either, so he has to do something. 
Black soldiers, of course, also made famous by the movie Glory, not just the 54th Regiment, but they were, they're paid less uh, than white soldiers. Blacks received $10 a month, and they had to reduce $3 for food and clothing, regardless of rank. White privates received $13 and free food and clothing. Right. So you, you basically, a black soldier gets $7 right, once you make that deduction. And a, a white soldier gets $13 um, there. Soldiers of the Black 54th Regiment protested the inequality and refused to accept pay. And that's the famous scene right there in Glory when Freeman and others are refusing to get uh, receive their pay. Um, and under, understanding that they're going, they're, they're being subordinate in their actions. Um, in Florida, the pay inequality enraged black soldiers uh, that they actually uh, rose up in mutiny. And their leader, uh, Sergeant William Walker, a former fugitive slave, um, was executed in his actions. On June 15, 1864, Congress passed a law that equalized pay for black soldiers and offered back pay to all those who had been underpaid or had refused pay in protest. So again, they come around, but the fact that you have to go through this, right, um, as you're fighting for this. Now, major battles do occur that blacks are participants of. Um, so, that, for example, in 1863, the US color troops helped the Union meet their needs uh, in more than manpower. They fought heroically. The Louisiana Native Guards that we talked about uh, fighting for the Union as the African Brigade and soon designated the 1st Louisiana was the first black regiment to see battle. The unit fulfilled its mission during uh, the Mississippi River Campaign by using its force to split the Confederacy in two. On June 7, uh, 1863, this unit fought bravely and defended the Union outpost of Wilkins Bend, Louisiana, despite the fact that they were the only that they were only armed with muskets. All they had was muskets in their battle. At the only armed with muskets. They had no other weapons than muskets. The battle uh, at the battle, the danger that black soldiers faced was highlighted as two blacks were captured by the Confederates and sold as slaves. So again, it's shown what could possibly happen to them. Yet the brigade went on to defeat the Confederates, um, and they defeated them at Pittsburgh on July 4th, 1863. So the brigade stayed together, which of course forces Grant to surrender. Um, and gain control, of, which forced Grant to gain the surrender and return the control of Mississippi to the Union. On the 4th of July, 1863, um, there is a, a, a series of major victories for the Union. The Union troops halted General Lee's march into Gettysburg during a three-day battle, and the U.S. colored troops did not Though they did not participate in this, they sat there in, in Harrisburg and Philadelphia, uh, ready to participate. Um, and in the midst of their invasion, the Confederate soldiers seized and sold a few of the Pennsylvania blacks. The 54th Massachusetts led, most notably by the battle that, Ju that July, a second assault on Fort Wagner in Charleston Harbor, which again you see in the movie Glory, where Colonel Shaw died in battle, and the regiment saw heavy losses, but the unit pressed on. On November 19th, 1863, that incident, the, the parade that I just talked about, Lincoln's going to travel to Gettysburg to dedicate a national cemetery honoring the fallen soldiers buried there. In the speech, Lincoln announced, quote, a new birth of freedom for a nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a huge step for him. And it's going to get even better in his second inaugural address uh, that he gives uh, when he gains election uh, and gives one month before the ending of the war. Right? Lincoln gains, re-wins election, 
And his second inaugural address that he gives in March of 1864, because the inaugural take place in March at this time, not January, like we do today. Um, he gives this address, and in this address, um, he has become the man that we like to talk about him as. He's issued the Emancipation Proclamation. He sees that this war is only a war that's going to be, uh, what, that the destruction of slavery must come out of it. And he talks about in that emancipation, or in that um, inaugural address, that this land must be purged with blood to, to end the, the bloodshed and to, to end our sins of slavery. Right? That's a very different speech than the house divided cannot stand that he gives. Or even the first inaugural address where he's talking about the union must come back together. So this time period does change. Lincoln. He's changed by the influence of um, people around him. He's influenced by the soldier's valley, valor. He's influenced by the continued uh, attempts by the South to keep the war going and continue to hold on to slavery. And realizing that this is the only way that slavery is going to come to an end. And so he begins then the following month to get, um, or the following year to get surrendered in April of 1865. And from there, we're going to move into a period that we begin to discuss what happens to these soldiers. What's going to happen to them? What's going to happen once they gain emancipation? Once that 13th Amendment is signed, finally signed? And then we have to have the 14th Amendment signed to gain citizenship. Right? And then we have to have the 15th Amendment signed because citizenship in many people's eyes does not mean the vote. So then we need the 15th Amendment. And what's going to happen during that period? And during that period is the period that we open up into a part of, of American history that we never talk about. We talk about Reconstruction, we talk about Reconstruction as a moment that takes place in D.C. A fight between the Radical Republicans and the, the Democrats, right? Who's going to define this newfound freedom in this country, right? And we talk about this over and over again. And we, then we end it with the Compromise of 1877, where Rutherford B. Hayes wins the election, right? on a compromise as long as he pulled, we pull the troops out, the Union troops out of the South. There's about 400 troops in the South at that time. It's not as big a force as you, we like to tell people. It's about 400 troops, not very many. The only states that have not been uh, redeemed or turned back over are Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida. The three places that there is election fraud and, and questions about election in that compromise. But what transpires before that to get us to that compromise is a moment where we try to figure out what, are, what African Americans are going to mean. What does this newfound freedom mean in the South? What is it going to do for us? How are we going to exercise our vote? How are we going to build property? How are we going to gain money? And African Americans throughout the South begin to do that process. They begin to build homes. They begin to buy businesses. They begin to buy property. And what happens is that organizations like the Ku Klux Klan rise up, founded in 1866. They become the military wing of the Democratic Party. And they, through intimidation and terror, beat down the African American population in the South and the white Republican allies of themselves in the South. And in that period, between 1866 and 1872, over 20,000 people are killed. In the strange numbers that we have today, we like to talk in government numbers, if 20,000 people die, we call it a war. So what we have between 1866 and 1872 is a second civil war in this country that we don't talk about. <coughs> and that's something that we have to understand. So what does this freedom mean? When you, build a, when you build a home that you have scraped by to build, 
you're being a prosperous landowner. In Florida, the, uh, Hannah and Samuel Tushnet, for example, build a wonderful home in Florida. And the Ku Klux Klan come to their house and beat them night after night. And then finally tear down the house, board by board, and tell them, you cannot live here anymore. A white man wants to live on your property. You must move. Why? Or you have a man who's done so well in Memphis, Tennessee, that he buys two houses, which is a sign of prosper. And he decides that he wants to keep one of the horses in a stable, because it's his good horse, something that someone would want to do. The other horse he'll keep out of pasture, being used on the farm, but the other one horse he wants to keep in the stable. And the white citizens of Memphis come up to him and say, what's going on? What do you mean? I pay my rent in the stable, but you can't have a horse in the stable. Why can't you have it? You're not allowed. As a black man, you can't have a horse in the stable. Really? I pay my rent. Shot dead in the street. Because he wants to keep his horse in the stable. We have a record of this material that no one looks at. There are 13 volumes of government testimony over 600 pages each. Someone told me, someone added them up. I read them all. I don't know. I, I stopped counting because I got tired of counting. Over 80,000 pages. What was this between 67 and 72? This is 66. It covers 66 and 72. The hearings in the United States is 19, 1871 and 1872. It is the closest that we will ever get as a nation to understanding a truth and reconciliation, understanding of violence in this country. Until the uh, Watergate hearings and the Ron Contra scandal, it was two of the large it was the largest government hearing documents that we had in our government collection. Thirteen volumes, over six hundred pages each. But it is page after page after page of testimony by whites and blacks, including Nathan Bedford John, Bob Forrest, saying he has no idea what this thing called the Kubat's Klan is. He has no idea why 130 people write him letters every month. They just like me. He tells Congress. And then goes home to Tennessee and tells how much he put up with a great act in Tennessee. Paint newspapers quoting him all the time. This is the type of material that we need to understand. If we're truly going to understand what emancipation meant, how that new free sense of freedom was defined or redefined, and why we continually are going to get from 1863 and continue to struggle over the same things to 1963. You need to understand that history. And the beginning of it is to understand the repercussions during Reconstruction. Because if we do not understand that, we don't understand why we're really having the same battles in, in 1963. Because when you look at the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and you look at the Voting Rights Act of 1965, of course, they're not the exact same, but they are really, in many ways, upholding the 14th and 15th Amendments, which were passed in 1867 and 1870 in this country. Why are we fighting over the same things again? And there's a reason why. That's a whole other question, but there's a reason why. Yeah. 1940, my sister was born in Charleston, South Carolina. I was born in Montana. My dad was a construction worker. I went to 26 schools by the time I was in the seventh grade. I lived a lot in the South. We were talking about this. I also recall being on a train in 1942, 1942 or 43, coming from the South. And uh, the black drafty soldiers were segregated. Sure, a separate car and couldn't eat in the dining car. This is 1943. Sure, I would say it happened. It would have happened in 1950. Yeah, and it did. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. And, and the problem in the First World War, sure, too. And the problem with these that guys were going free sure. guys in, in the Europe. Right. But the problem also with that is the story that's not told is that people um, that go and serve in Europe and return after World War I, the ones that serve in France because the U.S. won't let them fight under the, the, the American flag, or the ones that go to, in the World War II go over. They return home, they wear their uniform off the train like most people are wearing their uniform, and they're killed. There are numerous instances of, of African-American soldiers returning to their homes, getting off a train, 
wearing their medals, wearing their uniform, and being lynched yeah, because they killed them. Right? Yeah. Famous incident out of Georgia, right? We're, we're close to Missouri. So um, people look at, at, at Truman and why he, he issues his civil rights commission. And there are two instances. One, he sees a, so he sees a man that's blinded um, by racial violence, actually blinded. And it horrifies him. But there's also a, a lynching of four individuals, two soldiers and, and their girlfriends in Georgia. And he is extremely horrified by that action. You've got soldiers returning home, that he is the president of the United States in this action. And those force him in his conscience to create the Civil Rights Commission and allows Strong Thurmond to, to break apart the Democratic Party and run the Dixiecrats against him. That's why you get the Duke, you know, the Scottsboro Boys. Scottsboro Boys is, Scott's Scott's Boys is a different thing. That's the 30s, but yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Or any questions? It's a lot of stuff to throw at you. I told you you'd get a different take. Um, in my AP history textbooks, um, we're just now going over like um, uh, colonization in the United States and um, our teacher hand, gave us a handout today about um, slave rights in Virginia colony. Is it true runaway slaves could actually be shot just because they ran away? Sure, I mean, they could be done anything. It, 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 the easiest way to understand that is that a, according to most slave codes, so, so slave codes are slave laws against slavery or against slaves, you can define it as the restrictions on slave rights or the rights that they don't have, however you want to describe it. Uh, but in most states, the one thing that is one of the, there's like five characteristics that's consistent. And one of them is that a, um, you cannot be prosecuted for killing a slave in, in, um, in punishment, right, or in an instance of burning away. So absolutely, you can and you can shoot them and, and not be prosecuted. I mean, it's it's a horrible thing to understand. I mean, that's the biggest tough thing. I mean, jumping back when we talk about slavery, um, I always tell my students that we talk about it very coldly um, because you got to get the facts out. Um, but you've got to catch yourself every once in a while and realize that you're talking about human beings. Yeah. Um, and it's it's uh, it's a horrendous system. And like, see, we also we compare and contrast uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony and uh, Virginia Colony and how. Like apparently, um, uh, a slave woman, if she were to give birth to a white man's baby, that baby would still be a slave. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I was just astonished by that because the the father is usually the slave owner of like the plantation, and sure. like, so his kids working for him, and he's absolutely. Um, I'll do a twist on that in a second for you, but um, yes, one of the distinctions of slavery in the Western Hemisphere, because um, slavery exists around the world. One of the distinctions about slavery in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and particularly in North America, is that slavery becomes hereditary. Uh, and that hereditary line usually, not always, but usually follows the line of the mother. Um, so yes, a slave. And the other thing with that is, of course, if, a, if two slaves get together from separate plantations, right, that the, the child becomes the property of the man who owns the woman, not the Right, the man who owns the man, if you will. When the baby is born, it can be given or sold or whatever. It can be, certainly, certainly. Now, the twist that you want to do to that, to, to really to understand the messed up aspect of slavery, um, is, as you said, the slave master you know, is in charge of plantations, and they're having a lot of kids with, I mean, it's, it's rape, I mean, it's what it is. Um, but think, put yourself in the position of the slave mistress. Plantation mistress, so the, the wife of the plantation owner, who is on a plantation now, more than likely with multiple children who look like her husband in some way, shape, or form. Right? Talk about messing with your mind. Right? Um, absolutely. Right? Even, even uh, Thomas Jefferson, people forget this, they always like to go after him for Sally Hemings, which is understandable. Sally Hemings is 13 years old uh, when they're together, when they start being together. But Sally Hemings is the half sister of his his wife who has died. Right? Oh, wow. And so there's an element probably of familiarity that's drawing him. It's not to condone, but there's there's an element that he's oh, right? This is she looks like her. 
And so there's an element that I think that there's some solace at the beginning of that. Um, and it goes terribly awry, of course. But I think that that's but it's an element that people forget in that discussion. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but it's, it's, some, it's a fact that we have to understand. Right. You couldn't educate the children either. If, uh, if, if it was my child, my slave, and he has a child. Well, you can. Right? Yeah. Well, is that legal? Yes, it depends. It depends on what you do. There are many slave masters who are somewhat good to their children, um, many handful, um, and they send their kids to, to the north. Especially if they are very light skinned, um, very light skinned, and they will go to like Oberlin College and, and other places, and they will be educated and live in the north. Um, right. So it becomes a. I mean, that's that's a small percentage, but um, and some people do gain an education. There's no question. Um, but some people gain an education like Frederick Douglass gained an education. Right? Like Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass gains an education. This is what I always tell my students. When we read that, um, he gets um, he learns a letter every day by giving his lunch away. Giving his lunch. Lunch, his food, oh. right? So every day he tells the kids, "I will give you my lunch if you tell me what this letter means." Right? It's an important thing to understand, especially in today's educational system. I tell my students, "You throw a Cheeto on the floor and don't care." Right? In the middle of my class. And you, you're reading a book about a man who's giving his food away just to learn one letter. You fall asleep in my class with Cheetos stuck to your face. And this man's giving away food. The disconnect that we, that we have with understanding history and, and how far we've come and the importance of that history is, is something that I, I try to get the students to understand more and more every day. So, um, I will say, I mean, digress for a moment. I, I did scare them once. Uh, I was away for a conference once, and I found out that there was a food fight in my class. Um, I was not happy. Um, and we just happened to be doing Frederick Douglass that week when I returned. And so I came in and acted like nothing was wrong. And they thought everything was fine. And um, you could see them getting more and more relaxed um, as the, the class went on. And then we got to that point where we were talking about the food, and I slammed my fist down and started yelling, and they jumped out of their seats. They, they were terrified. Uh, but got the point across. This man's getting his food away and you're throwing it. Explosion. I'm not going to ask the class a um, question. Are your classes at KU uh, principally uh, African American students or do you have. No, it's a mixed class. Mixed class. Um, yeah, it's a mixed class. I will say, oddly enough, um, I say oddly because the University of Kansas has a very small percentage of black students. We have 3.6% African American population on our campus, which to me is a dismal. Um, and I say that all the time. Um, it was about like that when yeah. I was Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a state university, so what I always say is that it should match the state, um, at least. I would love to be more. But the state of Kansas is 6.1% African American. So as a state university, we should be 6.1%. We're not. Um, but with that caveat, I teach more African Americans in my classroom since I've been at the University of Kansas than anywhere else I've ever taught. Right. Which is an interesting thing because we have such a small percentage, right? But there are more black body spaces, however you want to describe it, in my classrooms in Kansas than they, they were at Yale, than they were at Gettysburg College, English College, uh, Massachusetts. Um, so it's a different. Thing. But yeah, it's a, it's a mixed thing. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, one, because we can have those discussions about race that we don't often have. Um, and two, um, African American history is American history. It's the core of American history. You cannot understand American history without understanding African American history. You know, we do not have American freedom without slavery. Thomas Jefferson is not able to sit down and, and contrast what is, a, what is freedom without having 200 people do his, the work on his farm, on his plantation for him. He wouldn't have the time, first of all, right? There's no time for him to think these philosophical ideas if someone's not doing the labor for him. It's easy for him to sit in his window and look out and say, ah, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, yes, right? And juxtapose that. No different than African Americans hear the words about slavery, right, when they, when they are going against the British and they're saying we're going to throw off the cloak of slavery, right, a slave walks by them and says, oh, 
if you're enslaved, I know what slavery is too, right? And they begin to use that rhetoric, right? So it's, it's there, but we would not have, we would not have our understanding of, slave, of freedom without that. Um, so that it is combined. Um, and, and our continued struggle to, to live up to the ideals of our Constitution um, and, and what our government's about, um, which is a wonderful thing if we, are, we actually live up to it. Um, that um, is to understand that struggle of why we're still struggling to get there. You need to understand African American history. Right? So I would say that it's, it's a good thing that it's a mixture because after, whites are, are there and they need to learn it because it's American history. But African Americans also should be there because it's, it's often explained that blacks don't need to study black history because they know black history because they're black. No. Right? It's no different than whites don't understand American history because just because you're American doesn't mean you understand your history. Uh, you, it's, you know, it's there. And that, with that, I would say that the key thing for me is to never stand up and tell you that I can tell you what it means to be black. I've been doing this a very, very long time, um, but I can tell you the history behind that experience and hopefully let you understand that experience more and, and come to grips with it and figure out where we can go. Um, that's what the education is all about.